and welcome to another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Joe Weisenthal. And I'm Tracy Alloway. Tracy, you know what I was thinking? Like, there's so much attention to Elon Musk and all of his controversies and the things that he does in his personal life and Twitter and potentially buying Twitter and the tweets and everything. I think sometimes people forget, like, what an extraordinary success or what an extraordinary company just like Tesla has been over the last decade. <laughs> oh boy uh where to start well first of all um uh, a cynic might say that elon musk courts that kind of controversy quite actively and that maybe if he wanted the focus to be on what tesla was doing um he could go about it a different way but anyway uh yes tesla tesla i mean just looking at the share price it's down obviously from its peak but over its history, it's, you know, a, a very successful company from a purely financials basis or just looking at the share price. Yeah. And, you know, like when I think about the last decade, obviously it was about the rise of software. Software is eating the world. Uh, cryptocurrency, all these sort of things that just like exist in code. And here is a company that became the biggest car company in the world, at least by market cap, by actually manufacturing something that is actually built. And so this was a decade in which people weren't really into manufacturing and really weren't into capital intensive businesses. And yet during that decade, this one uh, company sort of like just did extraordinarily well at a time when that wasn't really that cool. Right. Okay. So this is possibly one of the few things that you cannot fault Elon Musk for, but he certainly likes to make things, right? And you can debate whether or not those things are realistic, but everything from electric cars to flamethrowers to, you know, tunnels underground. Satellite <laughs> launching equipment that lands. Starlink. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he makes things at a time when the emphasis wasn't really on making things. It was on software, as you mentioned, and sort of the ephemeral stuff, big ideas and changing the world through technology, but not necessarily tangible technology. Right. And of course, one of our themes, and it's something that we hit on with a lot of our commodities episodes and you know some of our conversations with Jeff Curry and all kinds of things that we've been doing over the last year, has been about this sort of the revenge of the real, the tangible economy, actually putting stuff together. It's really hard, but it's sort of it feels like the sort of like physical engineering is going to be one of the huge themes of this next decade. Yeah, I think that's right. And again, I I think maybe we're so used to thinking about technology as like a search engine or a software company. But it feels like that might be starting to change. And nowadays, when people think about technology, when they think about technological prowess, it feels like a lot of people think about things like semiconductors and chips and the actual physical components that drive that kind of technological innovation. Yeah. And so when you think about like manufacturing tech, right? Like, okay, we're talking about who's manufacturing. You might think of Taiwan Semiconductor, which of course we've done episodes, Intel. And then another name that has to come up in all of that has to be Foxconn, which everybody knows is basically the company that makes the iPhones, the company that assembles. The <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I think, again, this is sort of one of the big themes that has come out of the past couple of years in the global pandemic, but also even the trade war before that. But we all are intensely aware now of how these tech supply chains actually work and where things are made and who is putting them together. Yeah. And so did you know, well, I didn't know this <laughs> up until recently, but did you know that Foxconn itself wants to get into uh, the electric vehicle game? I didn't know that either. I know that uh, the head of Foxconn, Terry Guo, I know he's he's a uh, he's an ambitious guy. He has plans, uh, but I didn't know about this specific space. So uh, yeah, I'm interested in learning more about it. Yeah, and I think you sort of like it's hard to understand the world over the last several decades without understanding the trajectory of Foxconn. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that they want to be a player in EVs is really interesting. So I think we should talk about it. Let's do it. All right, I'm very excited because in studio with us, this is a real treat. In studio with us, we have uh, Tim Culpin. He is a Bloomberg opinion columnist, normally based in Taipei, but is here in studio with us. 
and he is going to talk. He knows all about Foxconn. We actually, I think we had him on last year to mm -hmm. talk about Taiwan Semi. So he knows about the world of uh, manufacturing, the real economy that most people forgot over the last decade. Plus, he knows a lot about it. Plus, he brought us pineapple cakes. So, you know, <laughs> he automatically gets an episode. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for the pineapple cakes, Tim. No worries. I, apparently, uh, listeners, if you do want to get onto the Odd Lots podcast, you just have to bribe uh, <laughs> Tracy and Joe with, with goodies. And we just want cakes pastry. Are Tracy pastries. really likes sweet. Okay, I, I don't know Tracy's <laughs> opinion on Elon Musk, but I know that Tracy likes sweet. So, yes, if you want to get on Odd Lots, Send Tracy a pineapple cake or some other pastry, and you will probably get invited. It's outside. really that easy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tim, great to have you. Uh, great to have you here. What is Foxconn? Oh, <laughs> I didn't expect you to give me yeah. such an open-ended question. All right, so uh, so our producer Carmen's going to have to cut this after about three hours when you give me that question. <laughs> What's interesting, I'm going to go back in time in history, okay. uh, if, if you'll indulge me. Please. I think everyone first started to learn about Foxconn in 2010. That was when yes. the, the, the unfortunate suicides happened and, and the company became famous because of it. And there's about a dozen suicides that year. Uh, and even Foxconn uh, chairman and founder Terry Gore, at first there was a couple of suicides and he admitted to, to us when we interviewed him at that time, didn't think it was a big deal. And to put it in in uh, in context, at the time they had about a million employees. So if you go to any town in America or in China or anywhere in the world, you know, with a million employees, you, it's unfortunate that you're going to have you know a couple of suicides. It's just an unfortunate reality. So he didn't think it was a big deal, but after about the fifth, he was like, "Oh, <laughs> we've really got an issue here." Mm. And of course, uh, it got a lot of global attention from from everybody, including us uh, at Bloomberg uh, and Bloomberg Businessweek. But that's really what put Foxconn on the radar. But they've been going since the mid-70s. Terry Gore, who was born in Taiwan, uh, was one of the first people to embrace Shenzhen in China, you know, across the other side of the Taiwan Strait. He went there at the time when China had decided that Shenzhen would be this special economic zone. And China was just starting to open up to the world. And Terry Gore was very quick to embrace it. He, he saw a real potential. Obviously, uh, cheap labor was, was a real draw card, but he saw a potential for a very large labor pool uh, and also the fact that there could be a supply chain building there. So he was one of the first people to say, you know what, this, this is the place to be. And so he went and set up shop there. And one of the uh, the kind of the craziest ways or, or simplest ways that he could get hi he could hire employees because there was a lot of um, you know competition for for labor at the time uh, was that he decided to just treat them a little bit better than, hmm. than other uh, employers in China. Now people look at the Foxconn scandal and say, oh, you know, they're they're a sweatshop and they're terrible on staff and you know treat labor badly. Actually, in context, um, and I sound like a bit of a, a Foxconn apologist here. But in context, they did actually treat their employees in the early days and right through their history actually a lot better than, than a lot of employees uh, employers do in China. And so one of the first things Terry Gore did was he said, okay, I want all of my, uh, my workers to, to eat well. So every single one of them would get an egg a day so they could get a bit of protein. That was kind of a bit of a, a way out idea at the time. This was, just to be clear, this was in the 80s? 70s and 80s. 70s and yeah, 80s, okay. Yeah. And so- hmm. Terry Gore is not an electronics guy. Most people in the tech industry uh, have a tech background. They have an electronics background, um, maybe electronic engineering. Terry Gore studied at a maritime college in northern Taiwan. Hmm. Uh, so he really studied shipping and logistics. And then he moved into hmm. plastics. So his he's kind of opening uh, business was plastic injection molding. And if you think of Taiwan in the 70s and 80s, it was known as, you know, made in Taiwan, cheap plastic toys, Barbie dolls and everything else was made in Taiwan. So that was his business. Hmm. He was a plastics guy. One of his first things was to, to make the little plastic tuner knobs on RCA TVs. And over time, he, he went more and more into plastics. And, uh, and when the electronics boom happened from, you know, the 80s. He, uh, he started getting into the business of making uh, the connectors that would connect, say, your printer to your PC or your Atari to the television. And if you remember, you know, those of us of, of age can remember they were flat cables with, you know, 24, 36 <laughs> pins. They were kind of difficult to make. And so if you could work out ways to make these connectors, um, you could get pretty fat margins. And so the name Foxconn, the con in Foxconn is connector. 
That's <laughs> that's where the name comes from. I did not know that. And as an interesting aside, his brother runs a company called Fox Link, which does the cable part, the boring cable that goes between the two connectors. Uh, now, of course, that's not as exciting anymore because pretty much everybody's on USB and Firewire and everything else. But back then, there was like 60 different types of connectors. And, and since then, they have basically been a component company. And so we think of them as being a company that hires a million workers, uh, you know, at peak time to, to assemble iPhones. But if you look at the numbers, um, you know, back in the mid 90s, when the PC boom was happening and people like Michael Dell and others decided that they want to be into the P- be in the PC business, uh, Foxconn got into the business of just creating the components. They weren't really assembling that much. They were doing the components that went inside. And if you ever open up a desktop PC, you'll see the motherboard inside and there's just all sorts of componentry welded to the motherboard. That's the business that Foxconn was in. And that's, to this day, Hmm. kind of the business they're in right now. We just don't really think of it because it's not as sexy. But I'll tell you one thing, guys. The margins are really, really, really good. Hmm. So in 1996... Their gross margins were over thirty percent, and and if if anyone really kind of dives into um, you know the margins business, I know you've had Stacy Razgon on co cover semis. thirty yeah. percent is a really nice gross margin. Uh, and at the time, Apple, which was kind of at, at its worst period in ninety six, was doing ten percent gross margins. Uh, so they did very very well. Now. In context, margins at, at Foxconn dropped off over the next decade um, as they went more and more into assembly, which is not a margin business. I was going to ask, can you talk a little bit more about the difference between making components versus assembly and mm. why yeah. what Foxconn is doing you know, was, was somewhat unusual at the time, is, is my understanding? Yeah, no, that's, I think that's a good question. So components, um, I mean, the most High-level components are chips, right? Um, Tarmin Semiconductor we talked about before, and that's that's the sexy part of the industry. Uh, but going down the supply chain, uh, you get these chips and you put them onto a module, you weld them together. There's other comp- there's so many chips inside a computer or inside an iPhone that are kind of boring, you know, capacitors and and things that control uh, the voltage within inside a computing system. Now the thing about these is they sell for they sell for a dollar or two. They don't sell for a lot of money, but they're huge, huge volume. And because they're very, very, very specialized, um, it's not easy to swap out one component from another. So if you're a company like Foxconn, as they were in the 90s, and you work out exactly how to do exactly the right component with all the right specs, and your clients, all the PC makers, electronics makers, go, that's just the component I need. It's only a dollar. But I need it, and it's got to work. It can't, you know, it can't mess up. They will put in orders for millions of them. They buy them by the bucket. And if you're someone like Foxconn who can do that really well and set up a production system that makes them really well, you've got fat margins. So it's it's very high volume, but low price. Like the price point is very low, but with fat margins, you can be a very very profitable company. And you've almost got the market to yourself in some of these components because the barriers to entry are quite high. And that's really the bread and butter of Foxconn even to this day. They make a lot of money from an iPhone from the components that go inside an iPhone rather than actually assembling an iPhone. How did Apple find Foxconn? Well, when Steve Jobs came back, um, as we all know, the company was in trouble. They Apple was actually making their computers, like physically making them in California. But over the over a period of time, many companies, um, you know, Michael Dell and, and Hewlett Packard, Compaq, and others, were starting to outsource to Asia. And at some point during that period of time, uh, Tim Cook, who was who was um, you know operating officer at the time, he'd not yet become CEO, would have discovered Foxconn and realized that you know these these guys make the components. We should probably get to right. know them. And they really jumped into bed deeply when the iPod came out in the early right. 2000s. And that was one of the, really the first high, high, high volume electronics product after maybe, um, you know, the Sony Walkman. Right. And no one else really had the kind of scale in Shenzhen to do it. So it was really started with the iPod era. And it was only the yeah. iPhone that came, what, almost a decade later or less than a decade later. And when, you know, Tim Cook needed someone to assemble this new gadget that nobody had ever heard of but heard rumors of, Foxconn was the place to go. Wait, on this question of, like, assembly, so 
You know, I'm, I'm sort of thinking about like uh, actually our Taiwan semi conversation and, you know, Taiwan semi, you know, just like over time, like builds up an expertise to be able to manufacture chips at scale while making very few errors and they just become really good at it. What is like, is it similar with Foxconn where just over time they just sort of build up this internal muscle where, you know, you can come up with a new design. Here's the design of an iPhone or sorry, here's the design of an iPod. And because they've just like built up this sort of like internal tacit knowledge of how to assemble things, it's just no one else can really do something like that at scale and have it be consistently good. Precisely. That's really, really it. It's it's not that difficult to make one pizza. Yeah. Try and make 50 pizzas an hour or, you know, a thousand pizzas an hour. That's yeah. difficult because uh, quality yield, right? The amount of, yeah. of products that you put through the production line that are usable at the end, that is very, very difficult. Scale is really what it's all about. In Pretty much any industry, even in cars, you know, um, Tesla's, you know, struggles over the years have been about scaling. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, you're right. They had built up this uh, this knowledge base from making components so that when it came to things that were a bit more labor intensive, and they had used a lot of labor even for their components, this was the company that you would turn to. And, you know, what is it, uh, a dozen years after the first iPhone came out, 70% of iPhones are still made by Foxconn, right? Mm. They, they, Apple can't replace them. They're addicted to Foxconn. I was going to ask, what is the relationship like between those two entities? Because on the one hand, okay, Foxconn providing a valuable service for Apple, clearly, but it feels like Apple is basically reliant on one supplier here. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a possibly an unhealthy. I, I've argued for a long time. It's a very unhealthy codependence. Um, you know, there is really, if you look at the tech industry globally or or, or the world in general, um, you know, if if Apple was to de- disappear overnight, um, you know, we wouldn't get our iPhones, and you know, maybe that wouldn't be a very nice thing. Or if Facebook disappeared, uh, that would be terrible. Or, or some people might argue the opposite. <laughs> but if if Foxconn or TSMC were to disappear from the face of the earth overnight, we'd be in a lot of trouble mm. because nobody can do what these two companies can do, and they even if they tried, and so many companies have been trying to replace uh, Foxconn. Apple doesn't want to be addicted to Foxconn, right? It's just not healthy. It's not about them being a good or a bad company. It's just not healthy to have one supplier. So over the years, Apple has diversified away, ironically, to mostly Taiwanese companies like Wistron and Pegatron and some Chinese companies too. Uh, And of course, they've diversified away from China to an extent in India and Brazil and other places. But really, um, they they can't help it. And uh, Foxconn is also unhealthily addicted to Apple. 50% of their revenue comes from Apple. Hmm. Uh, And it's been that way for more than a decade. They brought in about $215 billion of revenue last year, Foxconn. And half of that uh, came from Apple. So they can't do without Apple unless they get into the EV business. The hottest gadget or one of the hottest gadgets in the world right now is the electric vehicle and Tesla is the leader, but we know that every uh, uh, every car company um, wants to get into EVs and they're spending a lot of money and actually rolling out cars and some of them seem to be decent. Before we get into Foxconn's ambitions in the space, how is manufacturing a car historically different than manufacturing electronics. I mean, my guess is like GM and Ford and all, they have their own plants. They're in the United States. They don't just like make a design and send it to some other company to build. They actually build it themselves. But how would you compare and contrast the sort of like existing legacy approach to building a car versus the existing approach to building a phone? Well, at the end of the or day, computer. yeah, no, it's, I think it's a fair point. At, at the end of the day, I mean, <laughs> car companies don't want to admit it, but all cars are kind of similar, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> now, where there is a difference is in engines, right? So companies like Toyota and Ford and, and the Europeans as well have, have worked a lot on, on engine design and and car buffs will say, well, this engine, this, you know, V6 or this uh, straight four or whatever is, is a better engine and, and a new car comes out with a new engine and, and people love it or hate it. Uh, but the other part, the, kind of the, the, the IP, 
uh, is in how you make it. And Toyota, I guess, is most famous for their production system, the just-in-time yeah. and all of that. Um, and again, it comes back to the issue of scale and, and quality and yields and so forth. So the very process of producing a car is in some ways that secret sauce. And so if Toyota, for example, or Ford was to work out uh, exactly the right way to make a car over, say, a 10-year production run, um, it's kind of a thing that they wouldn't necessarily want to hand out to somebody else. But the other thing is with safety standards, um, you, you have to be very meticulous. And the way you produce a car is so connected to things like safety standards. And the final thing is, um, the product cycle of a car is much, much, much longer. We're talking like a decade, whereas, you know, the product cycle of a phone, iPhone, Apple has the longest product cycle, which is about a year. But, you know, Samsung and Xiaomi or whatever, they come out with a new product like every three to six months or even less. So it's a very quick turnaround. And so they kind of need the external help to help put these devices together. I think that's really the big difference. So... Walk us through Foxconn's thinking here and what they see exactly as their competitive advantage. Because on the one hand, yes, EV is very hot right now. Everyone is probably going to end up having one in the future. But on the other hand, especially in places like Asia, the market is incredibly crowded. It feels like a new EV manufacturer springs up <laughs> you know, every week or every month and then probably has problems soon after. But what exactly is the opportunity here and what does Foxconn think it can do better than other EV manufacturers? Well, what's interesting, I think, is that you think of Foxconn as being the iPhone assembler and you think, well, if they're going to do EVs, they're going to be all about the you know EV assembling with big factories like you'd see in Detroit. That's actually not quite their thinking. They're more hmm. thinking in the 1990s model, which is in the 1990s when desktop PCs were you know the biggest thing out there, uh, it was very modular. You open up a PC mm. and it's very, very modular and you've got standard reference designs for what it would look like. And, you know, at, at that time you have, uh, you know, AMD and Intel were doing the CPUs uh, and Foxconn could make a lot of those component parts and get m good margins on it. They see EVs more similar to PCs than iPhones. And so they have reference designs, right? If you want to go out, like literally, if you had the money, you could call up Foxconn tomorrow and say, hey, we want to make an EV, we don't have a clue, we've just got money. And Fox kind of like, all right, we've got a reference design. Literally, it is a design. It's a chassis with four wheels, and they can basically walk you through the process. And for the right amount of money, you could have an EV, uh, you know, in six months. And that's why you've got companies like Lordstown and Rivian and all these other startups are actually turning to Foxconn and saying, Oh, um, yeah, we, we want to get into the EV business. Uh, maybe we should, uh, you know, get into bed with each other. Well, so when I think about like PCs in the 90s and there were just so many of these brands and they basically just all sold the exact same boxes and it didn't turn out to be. So there was Compaq and HP and or before that, I guess there was like. Wang. <laughs> yeah, there yeah. were tons. Of, uh, Gateway yep. was another one. Uh, and then, of course, Dell more or less won that space, but it was like not a great victory because the actual like boxes, you know, they won, but it wasn't like the most amazing uh, victory. Like, do the car companies like, OK, if, Fo if Foxconn's vision that EVs will sort of be this modular thing and there's a few standard parts they can all plug and play, like, do car companies want that future? No, of course, car companies don't want that future any more than PC companies want to have uh, PCs to be modular because there's no competitive advantage. And that's why Apple went, you know, in another direction. Remember uh, Zeos? There was the PCs. <laughs> that's what we had. Uh, we had a we had a PC in like in my family. I think it was from a company called Zeos. I remember right. a Tandy. I Tandy. Think we had no, a Tandy Radio as well. Shack yeah, Tandy. yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Keep going. Anyway. So um. So no. Yeah, PC company. No company wants wants to be standardized. Right. They want to have everything to themselves. In fact, you know, if you look inside an iPhone. Um, you know, one of the funny things about an iPhone is, of course, they have their own chips and a lot of their own things are very, very specific to Apple. But in fact, there's there's quite a few components that go in an iPhone that are no different to a component uh, that go into something else. But but Apple is very insistent with their suppliers that they have their own um, stock coding unit and it's labeled differently, but it's basically the same part. Uh, it's just kind of the Apple version of that part. So I think absolutely. I don't think, you know, Elon Musk at Tesla or Toyota or Ford or any company that's going into the EV era 
wants to have it standardized. But then again, they've got to make decisions. Where is our value add? Where is our competitive advantage? Is it to have you know all our unique components? And in the car era, having your own unique engine, you know, was a standout, right? And and that was a, a unique selling point. I think so far in the EV era, I don't think anyone's going up to an EV and going, well, this is, you know, the, the electronic version of, you know, a, a V8, right? They, of course, they want range, they want power, they want, uh, what is it, ridiculous mode and stuff like that. But if that can all be done in a, in a standardized modular way, then that would free up the EV makers to focus on, you know, the front end, which is the design, make it look cool, feature set, uh, and then the back end, which is sales and marketing. And essentially, that's what the PC industry is now. PC makers basically don't make anything. In fact, Apple doesn't really manufacture anything. Right. They they do the front end, which is the design. They outsource all of the middle, which is you know putting it all together. And then the back end, they worry about you know sales and marketing. And that's probably going to be the future of EVs. Certainly, the way mm-hmm. Foxconn thinks it'll be. And so there was all these PC makers in the '90s, and most of them have disappeared. Well, Foxconn's still around, and they just supplied to all of them. Right. That's the way they survive. Foxconn doesn't do their own branding. They just supply to the brands. And the new vision of Foxconn, and they've got a new chairman now, a, a guy called uh, Liu Yangwei, who's who's an electronic engineer by training. He sees that future as being Foxconn is is not going back to the mid two thousands, but Foxconn going back to the the mid nineties. Huh. And guess what? That's when the margins were really really good. <laughs> That's convenient. Uh, but it feels like to some extent the EV manufacturers might not have a choice here, right? Because chips have been an issue. And if one of the largest suppliers of chips says, we want to go in this direction, we're going to standardize, do modular component building, that sort of thing, it feels like they they might just have to go along with it, right? Yeah, I think so. I think that's a a good way to put it, Tracy. If the EV industry, it is very, very electronic, right? You know, every wheel has multiple chips just controlling it, right? Mm. Um, cars, there is more There is more chips in your garage than there is in your lounge room, right? There is so many chips inside cars, which is why with the chip shortage of the last couple of years, cars couldn't roll off the production line, right? Uh, but we still managed to get our iPhones. And so the EV era is definitely more and more electronic. And that's why in so many ways, an EV is more like a PC on wheels mm. than uh, than a Toyota or a Ford with an electronic engine. Really, That's the way you need to think about it. Certainly, that's the way a lot of companies think about it. And that's the way Foxconn thinks about it. And that's why, yeah, componentry, semiconductors, uh, non-semiconductor components, uh, there'll be standardization. In theory, that's that's where the industry is moving, and that's what Foxconn wants to do. They right. have a platform called MIH. They want to bring all of the companies together. They want to bring in the chip makers, not just the car makers, the chip makers, the electronic makers. They want to bring them all together and set the standards and say, we've got these standards. Hmm. You can buy some of the components from us and some from somewhere else, not a problem. You can buy all the components from us, whatever you like, but Foxconn wants to be a part of it so that as today, apart from iPhone, Pretty much every device you've got, whether it's a Dell PC or, um, or, or a Cisco router or some webcam, there's probably some Foxconn in there somewhere. That's what Foxconn wants to be for EVs. So I'm guessing this is a well, I'm guessing Elon, they're not part of Elon's vision. Like how does how does the Foxconn vision of how the EV industry evolve? contrast with Elon's vision of how the EV industry will evolve. Mm. Well, interestingly enough, Foxconn does supply to Tesla, but it's just componentry, um, not the final car. Now, Elon said uh, famously a, a few years ago, you know, EVs are tough. This is not the kind of thing you can you can outsource to Foxconn. I, I actually disagree. Foxconn obviously disagrees. I think it is the kind of thing you can outsource to Foxconn. It's exactly the kind of thing you can outsource to Foxconn. Uh, now, of course, Tesla makes their own cars. They've, they're building multiple factories around the world, and they believe that building cars is part of you know, the Tesla DNA and their, um, their competitive advantage. Uh, but if, you, if you're Foxconn or any of these other startups, then you probably think, Maybe not. And certainly to build your own car factory is is very, very expensive and there's no guarantee of payoff. Now, what's interesting is how about the existing uh, legacy car makers like the Europeans and the Japanese, the Koreans and the Americans? Do they 
still want to make their own cars or will they at some point say, you know what, we're going to outsource a couple of models of our cars Mm. to somebody else like a Foxconn. So one of Foxconn's partners is Stellantis, which is the the merged group of uh, of, of PSA and Renault and all you know the, the European car makers. They are actually doing deals with Foxconn. So we may see, you know, a European car come off a, a Foxconn production line in future, or certainly some of the components in these European cars may be made by Foxconn. So I think the interesting question is not the startups who kind of need to have a Foxconn. It's the legacy makers. Are they willing to embrace the Foxconn model? And and frankly, I don't know the answer to that. This might be an obvious point, but part of the thing that is sort of surprising me here, or I I guess I should say the irony here is that it seems like we've had these discussions over the past few years about supply chain resiliency. Uh, We've had discussions about the semiconductor shortage. And it feels like the response to all of that might be to concentrate semiconductor production and assembly even more in a single entity um, because they're sort of demanding market power or the ability to assemble cars in order to control the components that are going into them. Is that is that the direction that we're heading? Like rather than see multiple competitors spring up in the space, people start to retool their supply chain so that they don't rely on a single company. It feels like we're going in the other direction. Well, if you look at TSMC, I mean, they have like 95% of the leading, leading, leading edge, you know, capacity. But interestingly enough, that is not the type of ships that are chips that have been in shortage. It's mm. the, the old stuff, the, the technology that's, you know, 10 or 15 years old, that's been in shortage. And one of the reasons why it's in shortage is because people have been moving forward. You know, the chip industry, as, as you guys have spoken about uh, quite a few times, it's a very fast moving industry. You know, Moore's law means that every couple of years you upgrade your technology. But a lot of the, the chip designers didn't really want to move up the supply chain or, you know, the technology stack because they, they didn't need to. So that's where we are with the shortage. But going forward, I think... There's going to be a lot of uh, government involvement. Obviously, the US government, uh, Congress is kind of duking it out over uh, the CHIPS package, the CHIPS right. Act. The Europeans are doing a similar one. They would like to have uh, control of the chip industry in, in more companies, or at least in companies from, from their domicile. So obviously, Intel wants to get in on the game. Uh, there's European makers. But at the same time, they all everybody wants a TSMC factory in their backyard, right? Um, TSMC is the most popular uh, company in the world for, for um, you know economic uh, economy ministers because they all want to to get uh, TSMC over there. But if you look at Foxconn, what's interesting with cars is uh, you know it's just not as easy to you can't you know pack up sixty cars in a box and put them on a right. on a FedEx flight, That's what right? I was ask, yeah. So. Uh, this is a really smart way for Foxconn to to diversify geographically. Now, no matter what you think of the tech cold war, is it overblown? Is it unfair? Will it will it blow over? Um, it's really not smart to have all of your supply chain in one area. In the same way, it's not supply, smart to have so much of your supply from one or two companies like Foxconn and TSMC. It just doesn't make sense to have all of your supply chain in, you know, the Shenzhen area or Zhengzhou area of China. Foxconn knows that, but by moving into EVs as they are, they've, you know, they've got a plant in Ohio. They've got this factory in Wisconsin, which may or may not make EVs. They're looking at India and Indonesia, and we'll probably see something in, I would guess, Mexico, Eastern Europe. Great way to to diversify your geographical locations because it makes sense to have your car production closer to where your your market will be. Yeah, I want to expand on this further because, like, right, like if you think about, as you mentioned, uh, the era where they're selling, you know, millions of dollar capacitors by the bucket, and that's very easy to manufacture in Shenzhen and then put on a boat. Clearly, the geography of automobile manufacturing is already much more localized, and you don't see GM or Ford 
manufacture a car in China for the purpose of shipping it to the United States. And they set up factories in Georgia or Tennessee and still in Michigan or elsewhere. And so it does seem as though this would, yeah, I mean, uh, the the economic, the weight of car components, just the sheer size, uh, the cost of them, um, it seems like it has to be much more geographically dispersed. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's just a really nice segue for Foxconn to have less of their production capacity in, in one geography. Uh, and they don't have to be announcing that they're picking up and leaving China. They just, you know, all of their extra, every extra dollar of capex that they put into something over the next few years just happens to not be in China for hmm. for solid economic reasons. And so I would predict that, say, 10 years from now, a lot less of its balance sheet in terms of factory and equipment will be in China. And it won't be a case of them upping and leaving China. It will just be a natural kind of evolution away from China. And I think that's exactly what Foxconn and its clients would want. So I know you talked about um, the sort of the historical experience that lends itself to Foxconn moving into this area of EV assembly, sort of doing a similar thing to what they did with PCs in the 90s. But are there any stumbling blocks Mm. here? Like, what is the biggest challenge in moving to that production model? I think one of them, um, that's, that's a really good point. And that's the kind of thing that probably even catch out Foxconn. And I think one of them is regulation. Mm. Cars are very, very regulated, right? Um, in terms of safety standards, well, you know, there was emission standards, but obviously that doesn't quite apply to EVs, but there's various types of standards. And if you're going through the process of setting up, you know, a reference design um, and you're slotting in different components, even you know, like what kind of seats and, and you know, the seat's going to buckle up electronically or, or um, braking uh, and all of the other things. Like, for example, uh, Tesla had a minor problem recently where uh, the chip inside that center console was kind of overheating and that made it difficult like, because everything is controlled by the center console of a Tesla. Um, you basically kind of had to reboot the car to uh, <laughs> to make it work. Now, uh, there was no safety issue involved in that, but it highlights the issue that as we get more and more electronic, um, the electronics are very important. I think we will see safety regulators in the US and Europe and elsewhere want to be much more cognizant of that. And so this could be uh, a real problem for Foxconn or maybe it's an opportunity for Foxconn because if they can get into the process of getting the parts or or components or half-assembled cars go through that safety standard check and licensing themselves with the Europeans or the Americans or Japanese or whomever, then they could possibly sell that to the client and say, hey, this part of the process, the chassis with the seats and the engine, have already gone through compliance. It's been ticked Mm. and signed off. You should buy from us. Or alternatively, the car makers may find that's not working for them because, you know, Foxconn doesn't do that or doesn't provide that, and that's the car maker's specialty. They may decide, actually, it's still better for us to do this ourselves because the, the design process is very much focused around, you know, safety, building in the safety at the start of that process. Now, comparing that to the PC era of the 90s, as you point out, Tracy, there really wasn't that issue. Mm. You know, if Michael Dell wants to cobble together a computer, you know, in his garage in in Round Rock, Texas, he doesn't have to go off to some regulator who gets signed (laughs) off for safety. And so anyone could put together a PC from kind of standard parts. So I think regulation and safety standards will probably be the biggest uh, kind of uh, challenge the Foxconn or anyone, anyone who wants to get into the EV space will face. So I just have uh, two more questions. One is sort of quick. How big is Foxconn, I guess, I don't know, from a revenue standpoint these days, and how big does it see or how big could this market get or how important could it get for Foxconn? So their revenue last year was uh, around 215 billion US dollars. Um, by comparison, uh, you know, Apple's was you know, 360, 370. So about two thirds of what Apple's was. Oh. Um, interestingly, by comparison, 
Uh, TSMC's revenue last year was only $56 billion, so it was like less than, uh, you know, around a quarter of what Foxcom's was. But of course, TSMC's margins are, are, are exponentially higher. So that's, that's putting into perspective of where we are today. But going forward, uh, Foxconn just recently put out some of their own targets, and they think that they or they're targeting to ship 500 to 750 thousand EVs annually by 2025, huh. and they see that translating to 34 billion US dollars of revenue by 2025. So you know, um, back of the envelope numbers. That means they would expect revenue of around forty-five thousand dollars per car. So that's already a pretty significant mm. chunk of the of their business. That's then huge. That's huge, right? And, and even if they got really bad margins out of that, you know, one percent margins on forty-five thousand dollars is a lot better than ten percent margins on a one thousand dollar iPhone. Yeah, that's it. So then, I guess the other question I have too is like, the you know the other thing the uh, the big the key component in a electric cars, obviously, the battery, and there's a lot of effort. A, is that an area that they could ever get into, try to get into the battery itself, which is a really, seems like a very tough business. But B, battery aside, what are the p- components that they have like the best shot at uh, building? They are actually in the battery business. They're not a huge player. They've developed their own battery technology in Taiwan. I didn't even know this until I just stumbled upon it at a, at a conference one day, and there was this booth with Foxconn batteries. I'm like, you guys do batteries? Like, yeah, we developed our own uh, you know, technology. It's, it's, it's all chemistry, right, at the end of the day. Um, I don't know if they'll be a big player in it, but they, they certainly have that option. And I guess it comes down to who can get the lithium supply. Yeah. Um, you know. But in terms of the rest of it, I think, um, interestingly enough, you go back to their roots, connectors, like inside a car, there is a lot of connections. There's a lot of wiring. I think if, you know, we look inside a, a Boeing or an Airbus jet, there's like miles and miles and miles of cables and connectors and stuff. A car is kind of similar. Uh, so the connectors is definitely a great business for them to be in. And then a lot of the components, like um, a windscreen wiper, uh, the, the lights, all of those things just have a little motherboard with some co- components soldered onto it. And so they don't necessarily need to get the big ticket items. They could just tick off a lot of the kind of the smaller mm. items and just get a lot of them inside a car and just be that company that does you know, these 10 things really, really well that no one else can do and, and enjoy the margins from there. Tim Culpin, real treat to have you here in the studio. And this is totally new for me. I had no idea that Foxconn was aiming for this space, but it seems like an important part of the story. So appreciate you coming back on Odd Lot. Thank you for having me. It's been fun. Yeah, Yeah. thank you, Tim. And thank you for the pineapple cakes. (laughs) Love talking about semiconductors while eating. The real reason (laughs) we had uh, Tim on. But no, that was great. Thank you so much. Tracy, I really thought that was interesting. I didn't realize the history of Foxconn. I mean, I just basically sort of only, as Tim said, more or less ever heard of the company around 2010 when the sort of, uh, you know, when the sort of infamy of their iPhone production was in the news. But it's interesting that the sort of like real margin heyday mm. was in the 90s. I had no idea that like those were like super boom times. Right. Because everyone thinks, oh, assembling iPhones, yeah. you probably make loads of money off of that. But actually, it's building the sort of modular components yeah. for I didn't realize that they were like the ones PCs. building all those, those uh, modules. Yeah. The other thing that stuck out for me from that conversation was just the idea of a company like Foxconn becoming more of a force in the EV space by virtue of building those components yes. and in some respects demanding standardization. Yeah. And I wish I could remember who exactly said this, but you know, there was a school of thought that in the future insurers were going to be these massive mm-hmm. influencers on society and the economy because they're the ones that are ultimately pricing um and sort of dealing in risk. So they were yeah. the ones setting safety standards. Yeah. And I kind of, I think about that with relation to something like Foxconn. If they're the ones building the components and setting the standards for some of the things going into EVs, and, you know, to Tim's point, obviously they have to comply with government standards as well, but there are other things they can influence. It feels like they just become a really big force in the space. Absolutely. It feels like the existing 
automakers, obviously Tesla, but Tesla aside, but it seems like the existing automakers definitely do not want to become Dell and Hewlett Packard and Compaq and Zios and Tandy and Gateway. Yeah. And just be like pure boxes on a bunch of components that are all identical and no margin. But on the other hand, like, you know, car, I don't know, car, you know, it's like I, cars all kind of look the same, but of course car people would <laughs> they're like no he's like what but they're like wildly different okay, but yeah, a does, bunch of know, angry emails seem, yeah about... there's a lot of similarities between cars especially these days they'll kind of look the same well i mean I, it does feel like there is this massive tension between yeah. foxconn and its potential customers yeah. in the form of ev manufacturers and it's it, you know it's not again dissimilar to maybe the relationship between apple and foxconn but it's going to be really interesting to see how it shakes out and it does feel like a bit of a power struggle potentially yeah and either way it is going to be different than pcs or the iphone because of this there's all it's almost certainly going to be the u.s car market is served by u.s manufacturing whether it's a Foxconn factory, whether it's a Rivian factory, whether it's a GM factory, it's going to be domestic. So it's not going to be this sort of like, oh, let's build a bunch of cheap stuff in Asia for shipping over. There'll probably be some component shipping, but it will still be something of a new model that's different than Foxconn's past. Hmm. past. It seems like it. All right. Shall we leave it there? Let's leave it there. All right. This has been another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Tracy Alloway. You can follow me on Twitter at Tracy Alloway. And I'm Jill Weisenthal. You can follow me on Twitter at The Stalwart and follow our guest Tim Culpin on Twitter. He's at T Culpin. Follow our producer, Carmen Rodriguez at Carmen Armin. Follow the Bloomberg head of podcast, Francesca Levy at Francesca Today. And check out all of our podcasts at Bloomberg under the handle at podcasts. Thanks for listening.